Oranges are very high on the satiety index, as are potatoes, to be honest. Boiled potatoes I have in all of my weight loss clients' diets because they're really high on the satiety index. Carbohydrates don't need to be demonized. The reason I like them if we're having this discussion about athletes is because they lend themselves better for performance. Weight loss, irrespective of diet, can resolve 95% of health problems. Stan, when it comes to success, somebody trying to put on muscle, in your estimation, how much of that would be related to the actual resistance training versus other lifestyle factors such as diet, sleep, and and such? Oh, man, it's so hard to put a percentage on it. I mean, obviously, none of it happens without the other. Uh, it, it's a... It's definitely multifactorial. You can't just train and not sleep and eat, and you can't just eat a ton of food and not train hard enough. Uh, we do have a pretty good idea now of what a sufficient stimulus is to grow muscle and understanding that beginners will grow from darn near anything. And as you become more immediate, intermediate or advanced, it, it gets a little harder uh, and you have to be more I think uh, uh, diligent about applying the evidence-based guidelines for hypertrophy. A lot of the stuff that you know Brad Schoenfeld et al. have put out you know, over the many recent years about uh, just sufficient frequency, volume, load, uh, probably the primary drivers, train everybody part twice a week, try and get 10 to 20 total sets per week per body part. Uh, and then irrespective of what amount of load or rep range you choose to work within, your effort or intensity has to be such that you probably only leave a rep or two in the tank. So you have to train hard enough on each set. Those are the big rocks. Those are the monsters. And then, of course, really hard to build muscle without sufficient uh, nutrition, calories first and protein second on that list. Uh, if you're in a deficit, you know, especially if you're an experienced lifter, it could be really hard. So you need enough Nutrition and obviously sleep is enormous for recovery and, and being able to uh, to progress long term and put enough effort into the workouts to create a sufficient stimulus. So I think those are probably the big rocks. I know it's not terribly specific, but those are the things that matter the most. And Stan, you're somebody who's been in this game for many, many years, over a few decades, you know, bodybuilding, powerlifting. So you've seen a lot of things come and go. How much of the information that you're you know, using today to facilitate how you train people, how much of that has changed over the years? You know, the big rocks have, have been pretty consistent. We've known this for many, many decades uh, from all the great bodybuilders and powerlifters and athletes well before we came along. I think people knew you needed to eat enough, uh, get sufficient protein, sleep enough and train hard. I think those are the big rocks. But I learned a lot of lessons along the way. I always said if I knew then what I know now, that it would have prevented me from making some other mistakes. Um, on one end of the spectrum, when I was bulking up to try and become the, the, the best power lifter I could be, I did a lot of dirty bulking. I ate too big of a calorie surplus at times and probably put on too much body fat. Um, not probably, but most certainly. Uh, I, I've been over 300 pounds uh, and unnecessarily so. Uh, also at that time, I think there's times at which I probably trained uh, too much or too hard and unnecessarily so. We're seeing now from the research that uh, that you can leave some reps in the tank here or there. And boy, as much as I hate to hear it because of how hard we, you know, we love to train and what we wear it as a badge of honor when we go in there and crush ourselves. We need a sufficient stimulus, but not, not too much. So there's a lot of times at which I I suffered from, say, uh, you know, injuries or uh, overtraining that might result in uh, just a compromised immune system and you'd get sick. Uh, you're, you'll deload whether you like it or not, <laughs> whether you choose to or whether it happens uh, uh, in the absence of choice through injury or illness. Uh, you'll, you'll end up deloading as you go throughout your career. So that's in the bulking side. I, I, I ate too much at times, got too fat. Uh, and I probably trained too heavy too often. On the dieting side, because, you know, I competed as an IFBB pro bodybuilder and got down to single-digit body fat many times throughout my career. Uh, <clears throat> over-restriction, excess cardio. Uh, by over-restriction, I mean probably too big of a calorie deficit, trying to lose weight too fast, in which case you lose muscle tissue. Uh, 
<clears throat> excluding certain foods uh, unnecessarily so that might have compromised your uh, you know potentially create micronutrient deficiencies or um, maybe lower your testosterone or, or thyroid uh, things like avoiding you know I, I like a more diverse menu plan you, know, you always hear me talking about red meat for iron b12 and zinc and particularly with women we see them get iron deficient we see them get osteopenia from calcium deficiency and overtraining and under eating uh, in which case obviously more calcium or protein would help uh, and we see them get hypothyroidism and some of that might be uh, iodine deficiency and some of that again might just be too big a calorie deficit and not enough sleep and overtraining getting up at 4 a.m to do a cardio unnecessarily and then too much cardio i just find that you know i know there's a lot of consternation now about the interference effect and whether or not it's legitimate to and there's a lot of talk about separating your cardio by four to six hours or a day from your weightlifting training. But as you specialize and you become, you know, more and more, uh, I think, progressed in your in your competitive endeavors, I think you need to, to do more specific training for those specific endeavors and that, and that anything that is too big of a departure. I guess the comparison would be running marathons as opposed to a 100 meter dash. Uh, there, there is too much. I, I oftentimes would do too much cardio and would lose significant size <clears throat> and do a too big of a calorie deficit <clears throat> and uh, lose weight too fast and lose a lot of muscle. So on both ends of the spectrum, uh, I think those are the things that the mistakes that people make uh, just eating tilapia and uh, egg whites and protein powder and broccoli when they could certainly be consuming a lot more diverse micronutrient dense foods. And I, I love the lean red meats, the whole eggs, the dairy, um, <clears throat> not avoiding fruit, keeping salt in the diet, iodine for thyroid function. So I, I think, I think those are the big mistakes that I've made previously. And a lot of my athletes make that, that uh, you should be fixed. You talked there about comparing the hundred meter dash to the marathon. It gets me thinking about your two specialties over the years, you know, bodybuilding versus powerlifting. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap in in training and, and what those two sports are. But talk about the difference when you're trying to build for aesthetic versus strength. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> aesthetics is hard to put a finger on. It kind of has a lot to do with genetics and, uh, you know, what your shoulder to waist ratio is. And you know, a lot of that is, you know, not necessarily within your your control. <clears throat> Both of those sports are on the same end of the spectrum in terms of you want to have as much muscle mass as possible. Obviously, with powerlifting, you have to lift a little heavier because it's a specific skill. Um, and you want to train in those rep ranges so your body can perform under those loads. You don't necessarily need to train that heavy for bodybuilding. I didn't understand that when I was coming up in the sport. I thought the stronger you got, the bigger you got. But in fact, you can use higher rep ranges, and it might even be more advisable if, if as you progress in bodybuilding, you need more volume and frequency. It's it's uh, probably counterproductive to do <clears throat> too heavy loads because they create greater fatigue and take longer to recover from, in which case uh, it compromises your volume and frequency. So that would be where those two, I think, don't align. People always looked at me as someone who did both bodybuilding and powerlifting, but I really didn't. I did either or. When I was bodybuilding, I would bodybuild. I'd use more sets, more reps, more variety of exercises from different angles and more volume, shorter rest periods, um, and eat probably a little leaner, uh, just a little lower fat in my case, my preference. I know it's calories are king, but, and then when I was powerlifting, I was, I was powerlifting and I was doing movements that, uh, through ranges of motion that probably aren't optimal for bodybuilding, you know, deadlifts, uh, and even squats just to 90 degrees, um, probably, uh, don't give you, don't optimize your hypertrophy potential as a, a, a longer muscle length would through a greater uh, range of motion. You know, we're seeing now in all the research that, you know, if you can get 140 degrees in knee flexion, you're, you might see more, you will see more muscle growth. Uh, and particularly at the end of the lengths, uh, like in the quadricep, for instance, down closer to the knee might benefit from those 140 degree knee angles as opposed to a 90 degree knee, knee angle. Uh, it's it's small, but that's you know those, that's where we're at. We're we're trying to to excel in the, the last little one percent that we're trying to eke out. But those are probably the major differences between the two. 
And Stan, I think given your unique history and where you're at today, a couple different angles I'd like to take our conversation, one being for the person who is feeling very skinny, scrawny, and lean and wants to build up muscle and 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 work on strength and, and physique. And then the person that's overweight and that wants to include resistance training to get to a healthy weight along with diet and lifestyle. And again, those are two different areas we'll take things. I want to start with the, the first one I got into because looking at you now, people would never assume you were a scrawny kid. But let's go back there. Let's talk about growing up, what, what your body type was like. And then let's talk about some of the things you did right and wrong to put on muscle and, and gain that weight in a healthy way. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I was 140 pounds as a freshman in college. I was very thin. I was a soccer player. I wrestled 98 and 106 in high school. So uh, late bloomer, but even then I was quite skinny. And even after two years of training, I competed in my first bodybuilding show all the way back in 1988, and I was 158 pounds on stage. So uh, I was the skinny kid. Now, as far as body types are concerned, the uh, traditionally we recognize those as ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph. Uh, those don't require a different diet plan. Uh, that's not that's a myth that those people should eat differently. It's really still controlled by calories. The thinner individuals may have a higher basal metabolic rate, but more likely have more a higher neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis. They just tend to move around more and burn more calories over the course of the day because they fidget or tap their toes or they walk around while they're on the phone. They just, they burn more calories um, and, and they may or may not adjust quicker to a calorie surplus or deficit. We find that when you take a, a group of people and you give them a calorie surplus, some of them, their metabolism will increase and cause them not to gain weight, while others, they'll gain weight. And so there's very a lot of inter-individual variability in those studies. If you look at uh, how people respond, you can make a generalization as to averages, but um, not everybody responds the same. Same thing with weight loss. Uh, some people may compensate quicker and their metabolism may slower and they might lose less weight than someone eating an equivalent number of calories who, for some reason or another, genetically, whether or not you call it a, um, we call that a set point. I'm not sure if that's terribly scientific at this point, but uh, uh, people do adjust differently. So starting from there, the skinny kid, like anybody who wants to gain weight, needs to maintain a calorie surplus. Uh, as mentioned, you, you add 500 calories and you gain two or three pounds and all of a sudden th that extra calories don't allow you, your body to, uh, and your energy levels increase such that that calorie surplus <clears throat> no longer allows you to gain weight. <clears throat> so now you have to add more calories. So the challenge for the skinny kid is to, how do you eat enough food? That's the big thing. The training part is just a stimulus. Most of us, I think, get sufficient stimulus and, and it's the fun part. It's the easy part. It requires you know, what, three hours a week would probably be a sufficient stimulus, you know, even for an intermediate lifter to get satisfactory volume and load. And uh, obviously, you know, a little bit more may be better, but, but uh, it, it's not, it, it, there's some diminishing returns at some point. So the, the eating is the big thing. You, you need to maintain a calorie surplus so that you can grow. Uh, and so that you want to make that easier. So some strategies that I utilize is I use Foods that are a little easier to digest, uh, a little easier to consume more of faster, so you're hungry again sooner. Uh, meal prepping. When I was in college, I didn't walk around with a book bag full of books. It was full of food. And I, was, and I, would, I would set my watch, and every three hours, I would eat. Now, again, meal frequency isn't the primary driver. Again, it, it's, it's total number of calories for the day. But that allowed me at least to maintain a schedule that uh, under which by the end of the day, I could possibly end up in a surplus. And so uh, I would carry around Tupperwares full of food. Nowadays, I use that thermos, uh, $20, 24-ounce thermos off of Amazon because it keeps the food hot for 8, 10 plus hours. So I can travel with it and uh, I can make a couple in the morning with my breakfast and uh, to keep them with me throughout the day if I've got to go pick the kids up at school or uh, take them to sporting uh, practices, etc. I've got my food at all times. You know, and I've often said 
you know, and I, I work with a lot of young athletes too, including adolescents. I have a kids power hour on Sundays with kids that are from six to 15 years old. And I've often said I would no sooner put my, send my kid out onto a football field without a helmet and pads than I would have them leave the house in the morning without food, particularly if they're an athletic individual and they're training in sports. Uh, I want them to have, you know, sufficient meal and frequency and quantity to, to help them grow. And that adolescence time is, is important for that. So very specifically, that's where I come across the Monster Mash. Some people heard about with the vertical diet. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's ground beef or ground bison mixed with white rice, mixed with maybe a scrambled egg and then some bone broth. And you stir it all together, you know, and, and use however much bone broth is, uh, you know, however you like, the moisture level you enjoy. But it's just mechanically speaking, you can just shovel in more of it because it's so easy to, to consume and swallow. Uh, and it digests really fast. And then, you know, three hours later, you can eat again. So I use lower satiety foods. Uh, and I, and I try, and those that, that possibly create less gas and bloating, I kind of pull those off of what's called the low FODMAP menu, even though it's not a specific recommendation for, uh, IBS patients. Uh, a lot of those foods do tend to, to create less satiety, less gas. So you can, uh, eat, digest, and eat again sooner. And that's one of the big things that I think that helped me throughout my career and, and that I used with Hofthor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw and Lane Johnson from Philadelphia Eagles. I just made things easier for them outside the gym so they could accomplish those tasks, which historically had been somewhat uh, grueling, just to, just having to force down uh, or chase, you know, pizza, pasta, pancakes. So you're constantly on the toilet and your stomach feels horrible, you know, and you're, and, and those foods just keep you bogged down for hours and potentially are, uh, you know, can contribute to metabolic syndrome, whether it's high lipids or high blood pressure, or high blood sugars. Uh, I designed the diet to kind of mitigate some of the potential downsides of being that big and heavy and eating that much food uh, and just making it easier on people to do so. So that's the, that's the skinny kid trying to gain weight. That's their challenge. Can you eat enough uh, consistently enough? I'm excited to share with you my favorite magnesium supplement, Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. Click the link in the description to save 10%. And now back to the show. You talked about your mash there that has a handful of ingredients, one of them being the ground beef. And when it comes to satiation and, and making us satiated after a meal, I know a big part of that is protein. So yeah. with that ground beef in there, how do you counteract that if you're trying to keep no, this, point. the satiation low? I'm glad you brought it up. A lot of young bodybuilders think that they need a lot, a ton of protein in order to grow. And in fact, you probably only need about a gram of protein per pound of lean weight. So, or maybe 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight, however you want to look at it. In a calorie surplus, the calories are protein sparing. And so you don't need as much protein to be able to still grow. And the, but the protein, like you said, has a high satiety uh, index and a, what's called a high thermic effect of food. So for every 100 calories of protein you eat, you're only netting out 70. That's a strategy I use for heavy people who are trying to lose weight. I'll feed them more protein. The, the lighter athletes who are trying to gain weight, I'll actually pull their protein back, say to 0.8 grams per pound, whereas a, 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 somebody who's trying to diet, I'll be at 1.2. And so uh, I think a lot of these young, thin kids do overconsume protein, think it's going to make them bigger. And in fact, it compromises the number of total calories they can eat, which, uh, as we just discussed, isn't, isn't beneficial. So I cut back protein as well. You're right. And fiber, to be honest, because uh, that tends to fill you up. And fats, you know, because uh, those tend to, to fill you up as well and are more easily stored as fat, particularly in a calorie surplus, than carbs which could potentially be utilized uh, for energy for your workouts uh, and or stored as liver and muscle glycogen. So uh, it's a little harder to convert those to, uh, to fat. And so I do keep the fats low. Th those macros are generally, as I mentioned, about uh, 0.8 grams per pound of protein, uh, about half of that in fats or 0.4 grams per pound. And then carbs are the rest, whatever it takes to maintain a calorie surplus. It might be 60% of your, you know, 50 plus, maybe 60% of your total calories, uh, because in a calorie surplus, you're probably getting sufficient protein 
uh, so that you can use almost the rest in carbs. And, and usually those carbs for me uh, are potassium based first in terms of performance. So I'll start with certainly a potato. It's twice as much potassium as a banana. Uh, fruit, I like uh, orange juice. It tends to not satiate you as much as oranges. Oranges are very high on the satiety index, as are potatoes. To be honest, boiled potatoes I have in all of my weight loss clients' diets because they're really high on the satiety index. So I, I encourage my athletes to eat that potato two hours before training or for dinner because then they've got an extended period of time under which they can get their appetite back. And then in the meals that, uh, that I need them to eat more frequently, they're mostly using uh, white rice because uh, it's really easy to digest uh, and eat more of it again sooner. So that's that's a little more in-depth into the particular foods that I select and for what reasons in terms of satiety and micronutrient density. It's interesting, Stan, as I hear you talk about all these different foods. Carbs are coming up quite a bit, you know, through the orange juice, yeah. through the white rice, the potato. I'm sure a lot of people tuning in right now who have been listening to a lot of the previous episodes who might start to fear carbs a little bit might be a little yeah. bit weary hearing you talk about them so much. So what I'm curious, and you did uh, touch on this <clears throat> a little bit there when you talked about uh, foods, these extra calories being converted to fat and being weary of that. So when it comes to consuming these carbs as part of a balanced diet, how do we make sure that they're adding to lean muscle mass versus fat on the body? Does it just come down yeah, to these, the workouts or is, is there other, another piece or pieces to this? It, it, it is active individuals. But I'll say this, in the, in the Diet Fits trial out of Stanford, which is over a year long with 600 participants, and Gary Taub's group was participating in that research. Uh, he's obviously a, a proponent of keto diets. They found that once you control for calories and protein, where you put carbs and fats in terms of percentage of total calories didn't matter. And it didn't matter for weight loss and it didn't matter for glycemic control. And we have a meta-analysis of over 61 studies that was recently uh, performed that showed that carbohydrates anywhere between 15% all the way up to 65% on type 2 diabetics had no differential effect in terms of weight loss, glycemic control, HA1C, uh, all of those markers. And so it does come down to calories, first and foremost. If you're in a surplus, uh, then you you can potentially gain weight. One of the advantages of, of going, as I mentioned, low carb is it tends to satiate some people to where they don't eat the surplus. But it's ultimately, it's the calorie deficit. It's just uh, what type of diet allows you to maintain that deficit? Which one is seems the least restrictive to you? is what's important. So whether somebody, some people, they do intermittent fasting and they find they, that to just spontaneously, they end up eating less throughout the day. There is some research to suggest that eating a large breakfast that's high in protein makes you less hungry in subsequent meals. Uh, so there are some strategies we can apply. The ones I like to use is what you just mentioned. The, the big strategies are eat more lean protein, eat more fiber, and eat more high satiety foods and get your 8,000 steps a day maybe drink more water with a meal, uh, those kinds of things can lend themselves to just spontaneously uh, improving your uh, satiety. So you tend to eat less. Sleeping more is a huge one because you get the ghrelin release from lack of sleep, which is a hormone that stimulates hunger. Um, and then just being awake more hours in the day, of course, gives you another opportunity to get hungry and eat. So those are all, and none of those sounded very magical. You know, it's just a toolbox of things that we utilize to kind of help people subconsciously get in front of the hunger cues. Because if you're trying to white knuckle your way through weight loss with willpower, you will lose that battle. It, 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 uh, it's a very difficult road. You've got to try and get ahead of it with the, these other strategies, avoiding highly palatable ultra processed foods, which just again, spontaneously cause you to eat more of them. Uh, and you end up in that calorie surplus. So all these conversations that we have about carbs and fats and percentages, et cetera, uh, they're pretty equal in most of these highly palatable foods. When you think of cake or donuts or, you know, any of those ice cream, they're both high in fat and carbohydrates. It's not one or the other. And, and, and salt, you know, it's just that umami. It's that mix of very palatable food that just causes you to take three or four more bites or eat the whole can or carton. Uh, that's the concern. It, carbohydrates don't need to be demonized. 
The reason I like them, if we're having this discussion about athletes, is because they lend themselves better for performance. Fats are important for health. You need a, 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 you know, a minimal amount, but beyond that, which provides you a health benefit, doesn't give you an added performance benefit, but the carbohydrates can. That's, uh, that's why I utilize those uh, in these diets. So for somebody who is incorporating exercise, either weightlifting or cardio or whatever it is, do you recommend to them the days when they're going to be pushing it harder in the gym or on the track to include more carbs on those days? Or is it kind of just can. more zoomed out big picture and then looking at each day very similar? You kind of put this into a hierarchy. I said calories are king and then protein, you know, the total amount of protein for the day. The International Society of Sports Nutrition would like to see you get at least three, and they recommend four evenly spaced feedings for athletes because there's no mechanism to store protein in the body. And so they want to see protein boluses coming in periodically throughout the day. Uh, and then you get down to, you know, possibly meal timing. But again, each of these is, has a smaller and smaller impact on overall performance and overall weight loss. And, uh, but it can be a, a factor. You, you might want to load most of your carbs around the training bout. That certainly can be beneficial for people as they get to be an advanced, uh, athlete. Um, and so that is a strategy that, that will employ. Uh, I, I think the meaningfulness of it is small in comparison to the other things we mentioned, calories and protein in particular. In reading your book, the other time I know you're a fan of carbs is before bed and helping with sleep. And this ties into what you were just talking about a few minutes ago, getting enough sleep. So talk about how somebody can use that to their advantage to get those calories in if they're trying to up their weight, plus also use them to their advantage to get a better sleep. Yeah. Now, in terms of controlling for calories and protein, when you eat doesn't seem to be all that big of a deal uh, if you control for calories and protein. As mentioned earlier, when you have a big breakfast, you tend to be less hungry later in the day. So that might be a strategy that ultimately uh, spontaneously causes you to eat less, but it's the eating less that leads to the weight loss, not the timing of the meal necessarily. So uh, same thing with eating high satiety foods. If you if you overeat high satiety foods, you're you know you you can still gain weight as long as as you maintain the calorie deficit. Uh, I hope that makes sense. But yes, uh, before bed, not too soon before bed, having a little bit of carbohydrates. What we see is is that folks who go to bed with no glycogen now the brain wants glycogen during the night, and so it will get its glycogen. It'll increase cortisol and then uh, cause uh, uh, the liver to break down and release glucose into the bloodstream so that it can fuel on that. And so, uh, you know, I've seen this for, I've been doing blood tests for 25 years on myself, well over a hundred of them throughout my career on almost a monthly basis when I was competing at my peak. Uh, and then hundreds and hundreds of athletes that I've, I've done blood tests on over the years. Uh, and sometimes when I come across keto athletes, I'll see an elevated uh, fasting cortisol in the morning and an elevated fasted glucose in the morning, both of which can contribute to poor sleep potentially. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's hard to advise those folks to throw in a little bit of fruit with their dinner um, because, as you say, as people get pretty religious about uh, their their diet practices. So, uh, But it, it it certainly can help. You mentioned blood tests there, getting blood work done, you know, more so back when you were, when you were uh, competing, but it sounds like it's still something you're doing and doing with people that you work with. Let's get into the specifics. Somebody that's not doing any blood work right now and wants to start testing, getting that baseline and looking at some of these different variables. What do you recommend? Well, uh, fortunately, nowadays we have a lot of uh, telemedicine uh, opportunities. I use Merrick Health. M-A-R-E-K health.com. On my website at stanefferding.com, I've got a button you scroll down and click on. It says blood test. And it opens up and explains to you how to get a blood test online. And you can just go to uh, click the link and you can purchase a, a blood test from Merrick Health. And they send you a, they just email you a requisition form. You print it out, take it to LabCorp. Three days later, you've got your blood test. And I put the specific panel in there and I asked them for some specific pricing so that people could get that blood test, a very comprehensive panel. Uh, for about $140, which uh, historically I've paid over twice that. And sometimes cost can be a barrier to entry. And particularly for athletes and particularly large athletes, well, as well as, again, you know, women 
uh, chronically dieting, I like to see them get blood tests because it can at least create a sense of awareness or a call to action for some things that, that you know, generally speaking, I would suspect that they, they were experiencing anyhow. And that would, you know, be your blood sugars, obviously your blood pressure is something, you know, aside from blood tests that you should regularly check if you're a big athlete, because that's, that's very critical. It's one of the largest uh, causes of, of immediate health problems, you know. Uh, lipids, obviously, get your blood lipids checked. Um, and then some other markers, thyroid function. Uh, there's a whole host of tests on there, testosterone, estrogen, you know, prolactin, uh, the list goes on and on. Kidney and liver function for your enzymes uh, uh, to make sure that those are functioning well. And that at least gives you a, a sense that, that uh, you know, whether or not you're uh, progressing in your fitness journey with health in mind, understanding they're not the same thing. I've said that fitness is the ability to perform a particular duty and task. And if the fitness level required to be a UFC fighter or a strong man or even a 14-year-old gymnast in the Olympics is not necessarily healthy. We push our bodies to the limits and beyond. And so a lot of what I do for myself and for my athletes is just try and mitigate damage, just behind the scenes, make sure I'm not compounding the problem with uh, poor dietary practices or sleep or allowing things like blood pressure and blood sugar and lipids and thyroid function to, to remain uh, you know, poor over an extended period of time and cause significant health problems. What's some of the damage you found in your blood work over the years? And then when you go and zoom in and figure out what's going on there, what was causing those? All of the things I mentioned in terms of metabolic syndrome, uh, including high blood pressure, high blood sugar, uh, dyslipidemia, high LDL in particular, uh, kidney and liver enzyme function, fatty liver disease, all of those things are quite common uh, with people who maintain a significant amount of weight and certainly excess body fat for powerlifters, strongmen, linemen in football, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, I mentioned this recently on the Tom Bilyeu podcast and Merrick Health reposted it and it had over 3 million views and 70,000 shares because I said weight loss, uh, irrespective of diet, can resolve 95% of health problems. And uh, I specifically mentioned the McDonald's diet as proof of that because the, the, there was a study done uh, where he ate at McDonald's every day, uh, but lost 30 or 40 pounds and walked for 30 or 40 minutes a day. And uh, at the end of the study period, all of his blood markers improved. We see this with uh, keto diets as well, which I think that the literature would suggest that a poorly implemented keto diet can raise LDL, which is a uh, definitely a causal factor of um, uh, of cardiovascular disease. So, <clears throat> but if they lose a significant amount of weight, their LDLs may improve initially, uh, along with blood pressure and blood sugars, etc. Uh, so, a, you know, a well implemented keto diet would keep saturated fats under 10% because that's a, a, a direct driver of LDL, in which case you'd use more monounsaturated fats and nuts and salmon and, and, uh, uh, extra virgin olive oil, et cetera. Just a, a short aside on that, because, I, I, you know, I'm agnostic. I think there's many paths to the same destination. And I have clients that do keto. I have clients that are vegan, all the way up to including competition. Um, I have clients that, that, that intermittent fast. Uh, I don't care. You know, I help them find the, the diet that's easiest for them to follow and help them reach their goals. I make some su suggestions in terms of performance. Even some of the, the, the longtime keto advocates Dr. Peter Atia, uh, Mike Mutzel, uh, uh, even Dr. Paul Saladino, uh, even a longtime keto advocates, and I've been on you know a lot of their podcasts. Over time, have come to realize um, that some carbohydrates around training significantly helps with the training bout and can improve their performance over time. Uh, so they're a little less. I think staunch about maintaining uh, keto all all day every day. Um, but again, I, the point of the whole conversation is is that, that I'm not here to shit on anybody else's diet plan. I'm just saying that there's a lot of things to consider, a lot of boxes that you want to check, both for short term and long term performance, weight loss, body composition, 
you know, strength, all of that. So I just, that's what I try and do with the clients is just let them know what the, the best research suggests and based on your blood test, what the, you know, what kind of protocol you should implement in order to optimize those numbers. You've talked about intermittent fasting now a couple of times and Stan, obviously you're somebody in a unique position who even now in retirement maintains an enormous amount of muscle mass. So I'm sure you're somebody who is, you know, cognizant and always trying to get enough calories to maintain that. But are you somebody that's ever played with intermittent fasting yourself or talk more about how you feel somebody else that you're working with using that either for weight loss or general health? I have not. I've always been a skinny kid that's had trouble gaining weight. I needed to get my at least three or four meals in a day. Uh, I, I still train at a very high level. You're right. It's difficult for me to consume enough calories. And so cutting out an entire meal is probably not the best option. I'll lose weight pretty quickly on that. Uh, I do like that intermittent fasting may for some people, again, spontaneously allow them to maintain a calorie deficit because they just eliminate an entire meal. And they may experience some level of satiety from that. Uh, although now most of the research suggests early time restricted feeding is the way to go, meaning eating a big breakfast uh, and then maybe skipping dinner. Uh, early time restricted feeding as opposed to waiting till two o'clock to eat breaks that cortisol, uh, uh, extended cortisol spike in the morning and gets you started you know, with anabolism, which is where you kind of want to be if you're training. And I think everybody should train. Um, I mean, I, I recommend weightlifting before I recommend cardio to weight loss clients. Um, it's not a either or conversation, to be honest, but uh, if you want to talk about which one I think is most important uh, with people doing weight loss, I want to make sure they don't lose muscle tissue because that, that's going to uh, be very adversely affect their, their basal metabolic rate. So uh, and the early time restricted feeding also tends, as mentioned earlier, to result in less uh, postprandial glycemia. Uh, you tend to be more insulin sensitive in the morning at breakfast than you are at dinner. Uh, and so your, your blood sugar spikes and the duration of blood sugar elevation, what we call the area under the curve, tends to be less when you eat a big breakfast as opposed to a, a huge dinner. Uh, which isn't all that important for metabolically healthy people. This idea of, of getting a glucose spike being adverse to your health, it's normal. It's quite normal. And it's, uh, it's perfectly healthy. And as mentioned earlier, even in type 2 diabetics, uh, a large range of carbohydrate consumptions can result when controlling for calories and protein in the same weight loss and, and uh, blood sugar management. Um, also, it seems to be better for sleep. It appears that uh, eating the bigger breakfast and the smaller dinner helps with your circadian rhythms. And so those are just some contributing factors that, that might uh, be better. I personally don't intermittent fast. I try not to eat uh, too huge a dinner before bed because it can uh, disrupt or interfere or lessen the effectiveness of your REM and stage four sleep. So I'm kind of cautious about that. But uh, other than that, I'm, um, I, I, I ask my clients when they like to eat. Uh, and what they like to eat. And I try and design a program that they can adhere to that's consistent with their lifestyle so that it doesn't really feel like a diet per se, but it's uh, it's something that they can, uh, it's a lifestyle that they'll maintain forever because it, it really isn't that we call it a diet, but it's just the food we eat. It's not something you go on and off. Uh, it's just a, a dietary pattern that you understand to be and the evidence suggests is healthy and you strive to to maintain as close to that pattern as possible. You know, I think Alan Argon calls it the flexible diet. And I think Lane Norton talked a lot about uh, if it fits your macros. And there's certainly some bastardizing of both of those programs. Uh, but generally speaking, if we can get as close to, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If we can get as close as possible to to meeting all of these uh, these checklist items, the big rocks, I, I think, you know, long term people would would uh, uh, would be perfectly healthy as a result. Do you have a specific time of day you usually work out? And is there a certain meal that you'll have on a regular basis before you go to the gym? I currently work out in the morning. I like to get it out of the way. I, I just feel I'm more focused uh, mentally uh, when I can when I can get in there in the morning. By the end of the day, so much has gone on that you're just you're, it's brain fatigue. And, and really, people think they're tired at night, even though they haven't done much activity during the day. But psychologically speaking, the fatigue is mental. Uh, that's why when I do have clients that, uh, you know, train at night and they say they're a little tired, come home, take a shower, uh, 
you know, have a little bit of food, maybe some fruit or something, and, and maybe they need a pre-workout, but it's, it's generally uh, mental fatigue, not physical fatigue. And if you can get over that hump, uh, then training at night's fine. When you train, doesn't really matter as long as you consistently train at that time. You'll you'll over time you'll adapt to it and perform just as well, whether it be morning or night. I train in the morning and I, I try and get a big breakfast in uh, about two hours before training is my goal. And uh, uh, all my meals kind of look the same. It's a it's usually a lean protein source like top sirloin steak or uh, egg egg white blends, some uh, fat free Greek yogurt. I'm uh, probably getting in 50 plus grams of protein at each of four meals a day. It's 50 to 60 grams of protein. Um, and then it's generally low in fat. The fats are already in the eggs. They're already in the lean meats. Uh, I don't need to add any additional fats to the meal. And then after that, I'm chasing, as mentioned, uh, potassium rich carbs first. I might uh, I like to get you know my, my dose of fiber for the day. So I might throw in a little bit of oatmeal in the morning and a potato. Uh, and then if, if I have to increase my calories, I'm just throwing rice down because I can consume a lot of it and it'll digest quickly and I'll be able to eat my next meal again. The difference between a, say a 3000 calorie diet and a 4000 calorie diet for the same individual, the 3000 calorie diet is going to include sufficient protein and sufficient fats for health. Well, now if you need 4000 calories to grow or to fuel your workload, if you're a two a day CrossFitter or a football player. The difference between those two diets is three cups of rice. That's the difference. And you can add one cup to each of three meals, uh, you know, and, and there your problem solved. And I actually like to, for the weight gainers, back to the skinny kids, I sprinkle a little bit of dextrose on the rice if it's a separate serving that I'm purposely eating to, to, to drive my calories up into, into a surplus. And the dextrose uh, isn't to drive calories. It's just to increase amylase. Uh, and saliva so that it's just, again, mechanically speaking, either easier and faster to chew and swallow that food and more palatable. Uh, so, and it's kind of like uh, sushi is sugar rice. I don't think people realize that, but uh, they can eat a lot of it and they're hungry an hour later. And that's because it's sugar rice. And it's generally lower in fat, depending on what, what you use as the protein source in it. But uh, so that's one of the strategies that I utilize and the, the foods that I commonly eat. I'll, uh, I'll also have a cup of milk uh, or yogurt and I'll have orange juice because it's, again, uh, less satiating. There's a lot of good research behind orange juice and, and people don't realize they they demonize it like Coca-Cola, but they're very different. And, uh, and there's plenty of good uh, studies that have been published in, in, uh, in, in peer reviewed journals to show that it does not elevate uric acid. It does, uh, it actually decreases AST and ALT. It decreases LDL. Uh, I'm not talking about drinking a gallon of orange juice, but I've been promoting drinking three or four ounces with each of a few meals daily uh, for the health benefits. The polyphenols uh, seem to, to have a, a great um, health benefit as well. So I, I throw all that research into my ebook as well. I talked about this five years ago in my Iceland seminar when I was presenting up at Hofbrau Bjornsson's gym. And people just went ape shit. They went crazy. You're just drinking sugar, you know, and they, and they just they just don't understand the research. It's pretty clear. As long as it, it doesn't cause you to edge your way into a calorie surplus uh, and you're overweight trying to lose weight, uh, that's fine. I would I would choose fruits. I would choose blueberries, blackberries, uh, strawberries, uh, oranges, long before I'd choose juice for those people because uh, liquid calories are just simpler to overconsume. But there's a place for it for the the uh, the thin athlete that's trying to gain weight. How do you feel about protein powders? And if you're a fan, are you somebody that likes to bring one of those shaker bottles and have some during the workout or right after the workout? Or how do you feel about all that? It's food in the can. I, I don't want to knock it, but that's all it is. And again, not as satiating as protein from lean food sources, not as micronutrient dense in terms of iron and B12 and zinc and creatine and creatinine and all those things that you find in a piece of top sirloin steak. Uh, I've always had a hard time gaining and, and maintaining body weight on liquid, uh, on purely shakes. Jay Cutler talked about this some many years ago as well. And just, you know, just from experience, I hate to, to, you know, throw my anecdotes onto this conversation, but, uh, between that and testimonials from many, many clients I've worked with over the years, uh, they may serve a purpose in a meal that is insufficient in protein. Uh, but they're no better than food. And I would argue that there's some shortcomings as compared to food. Now, in these low calorie, like uh, type 2 diabetic triage situations uh, where, uh, you know, you need to get in and get them to lose a lot of weight quickly. 
we see that liquid diets are very effective, like an 800 calorie uh, liquid diet within seven to 10 days can have a significant impact on reducing HA1C and, uh, and lowering liver fat. You know, if a 7% weight loss can resolve 95% of fatty liver and a 15% weight loss can uh, potentially restore beta cell function, in which case you can, you know, type 2 diabetics may uh, become uh, not be, uh, be able to, to not be insulin uh, dependent and have to use, uh, you know, exogenous insulin prescriptions. Not everyone, if you've been type 2 diabetic for a long, long time, that the beta cell function may, may be reluctant to, to restore. But uh, that's just some, some facts regarding, you know, again, I don't want to shit on powders because there's a place for them. And uh, it just depends on who you are and what they're being used for. But they're not magic. They don't improve your performance anything greater than a similar amount of protein from a meal. But they might just be more convenient. And they taste good. And if somebody is going to include those as part of the routine, is there a certain one you recommend over others? Because nowadays, you know, there's just so many different plant-based ones. You have your classic yeah. whey protein. How do you feel about the different varieties? You know, I got to defer to the, the experts on that. And I, you know, I was I'm a big believer in animal proteins, but when Stu Phillips lab has done a lot of work and there's been a lot of research uh, out of McMaster University up in Canada. Stu does a, a lot of research up there on protein. Uh, and muscle mass. And there are some uh, uh, vegan protein powders, uh, blends in particular, that provide sufficient leucine uh, to you know, give you a, a hypertrophy response, uh, sufficient muscle protein synthesis. Uh, so I, you know, I've got to be cautious just because it's not something that I consume or recommend. It doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't work just as well. Uh, I would usually recommend the way isolate. And uh, that's just because for digestibility, uh, some people may have trouble with the casein proteins or the, just the straight whey, which would be a blend of casein. And, uh, that might cause some digestive distress. So that's kind of where I start with. And it, it's, you know, it's reasonably affordable and, and to well tolerated by most people. Earlier, you talked about the protein bolus throughout the day. And I can't recall if you're talking about conventional you know, weightlifting wisdom, or if this was your recommendation, but let's get into this. Let's talk about timing of that protein, whether it be through food or through a drink, like we're talking about here, how critical is it to get that within a certain time around your workout? Or is it more just within the day? Within the day is the single most important factor, getting a daily total of protein in. And again, Somewhere around 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight is, uh, you know, so about 0.8 per pound uh, for athletes trying to optimize performance in particular, or retain lean mass in a diet. Um, although if the training stimulus is significant enough, even a half a gram of protein per pound of body weight has shown equivalent uh, lean mass retention, although the higher prone did, did show a little bit more lean mass gain. But those people were exhausted at the end of the, the, the trial because you have to train really darn hard uh, in order not to lose muscle tissue in a calorie deficit, particularly when you're on lower protein. So the protein for the day is most important. Secondary to that would be how what's the frequency, and particularly if you're training. We'd like to see you get some protein in within a couple hours before and within a couple hours after, kind of a five-hour span uh, of training to optimize the, the training stimulus and, and to, to, I think, maximize the benefit. And again, just it, it, if you're a 200 pound athlete, and you need 160 grams of protein. It's pretty hard to eat that in one meal is what it kind of comes down to. And, and pretty hard to eat that in two meals, 80 grams of protein. Eh, not that hard. Maybe if you're adding a supplement or, you know, but you could get there, but three meals, pretty easy to meet that. And so, Again, the ISSN suggests uh, that three to four evenly spaced feelings, they lean feedings, they lean towards four, uh, is probably optimal. This kind of gets down to, you know, on the hierarchy of most important to least important. Uh, it, it gets down there with meal timing. It, it's, 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 uh, it's not inconsequential, but it's not the primary driver of results. But uh, uh, so I would say three to four feedings a day on average, and whether or not you fit those into a particular time window, that's fine. You could, even in a 16-8, you could get three meals uh, in that 16-8, an eight-hour time span or thereabouts. 
uh, each having 50 grams of protein and, and, you know, satisfactorily meet your protein requirements. And as you train harder and harder and gain more and more muscle, you may need uh, more protein throughout the day. And, and that could be harder to do in fewer feedings. So I think that's where generally where the science lies on that. So when it comes to the vertical diet, you have four components, and we've talked about a few of them already quite in detail. The food, the sleep we touched on, the exercise, and then the piece we haven't really dug into yet, which is important, and I'm glad to see it's one of the pillars here, is recovery. It's not the glamorous, sexy thing to talk about when it comes to you know working out and, and putting on muscle, but let's talk about getting that dose right and why you've included that as one of the pillars. Yeah, you know, I it is very comprehensive. Recovery, obviously sleep, sufficient calories and protein uh, are huge in terms of recovery, as is fatigue management from the training stimulus. You, you can go in and crush yourself too hard in the gym and it'd be hard to recover. Even people who start weight loss programs, oftentimes they'll go in and start trying to, to start this real aggressive training program. And then what occurs is a phenomenon that we call compensation. It seems as though what exercise you do during the day is compensated for in your non-exercise activities. You go to the gym, crush yourself for 30 or 40 minutes doing metcons with battle ropes and burpees. You tend to come home and sit more and eat more because you're hungry and you move less. And that becomes kind of a, an even sum game. Uh, not to say that exercise isn't great for other reasons, you know, cardiovascular health, et cetera. But if you could obtain that with less fatigue, it's both for the competitive athlete and for the general weight loss person, you kind of want to minimize, you want to, you want to maximize the, the stimulus and minimize the fatigue of any given workout. I do this with athletes in particular. I do it with myself now at my age at 55. If I want to go in and lift heavy, I got to be cautious to lift around those lifts doing lower fatigue movements so that ultimately I can maybe test those lifts on a, maybe a monthly basis. It's what I've been doing recently with my deadlift. I'll go and do some box squats or some concentric good mornings where I'm just lifting the weight up and then crashing it down into the chains. I'm el eliminating a lot of the eccentric load and eliminating the need to reverse the direction of the weight, both of which create a significant amount of muscle damage. Uh, but they make me stronger uh, because I'm lifting reasonably heavy weights with less fatigue. And then once a month or so, I can test my deadlift and see if those accessories are transferable to improving my deadlift total. I do the same thing with athletes. Uh, I'll put them on a belt squat or use box squats or, or the kinds of low fatigue exercises. Uh, a chest supported row as opposed to a bent row would be another example of a, of a less fatiguing exercise that still gives them a a sufficient workload to uh, to increase strength that's transferable to their sport because I don't want to make them so tired they can't do their sport specific training their jujitsu and their boxing and their wrestling uh, that is obviously takes a precedent over their strength training so uh, I try and design programs so that they're not too fatiguing uh, and that you know we don't overload people in terms of exercise. So the fourth component you said in terms of recovery that that um, that we haven't discussed too much yet, I may have mentioned it, is uh, the walking, the 10 minute walks. It, it does appear that 30 minutes uh, or 10 minutes three times a day is better than 30 minutes at the end of the day. We see that in a lot of research in terms of sedentary office workers versus who move frequently throughout the day as opposed to those who uh, move once at the end of the day. The, the frequency does seem to matter. It matters for digestive control and glycemic control post meal. It matters for um, uh, for uh, digestion. It helps uh, stimulate you know muscular contraction and uh, uh, the uh, enzymatic action for digestion. Uh, also helps with the joints to frequently get them moving, the pumping blood through your hips and your knees. And so I recommend people take a 10 minute walk after each meal, three or four times a day. There's your 30 to 40 minutes of cardio and it's deliberate, it's brisk. It's not a jog, but it, it you know, your arms are pumping and you're getting your heart rate up a little bit and you're, you know, you're able to, to maintain a somewhat of a conversation, but you, you know, you're going to be breathing. Uh, and it's something that you can progress over time as to how fast you go and how long you go. But I like attaching that to, uh, I like attaching a behavior to an existing behavior if I'm trying to create a habit out of it 
30, 40 minutes of cardio at the end of the day. You got to come home. You got to change. You got to get in the car. You got to drive to the gym. There might be other things influencing your ability to get there consistently. And, uh, uh, and then what happens is you, you just start not complying, which is the, you know, the primary problem. So the 10 minute walks are big as far as recovery for me or a recumbent bike. Hofthor had a bike in his garage and in Iceland, it wasn't always possible to walk. Uh, and he would ride that bike after uh, training or after eating three times a day. We did it together when, when I was up there three or four times a day. Uh, also, I would caution about this. And like, I'll, I'll take a lot of heat for this, but I, I just have to keep reminding folks that things are done to you or for you are rarely as effective as things you do for yourself. And sometimes people kind of outsource their recovery uh, to passive interventions. And that's fine. I think those people can serve, serve a purpose if they can help facilitate movement. But it's the movement itself. We see this with back pain. Uh, manual interventions aren't nearly as effective as any type of movement. We consistently see this in the research. And so if you're going to someone who's moving you around, but you're not actually out moving, if you go to someone, physical therapist or a chiropractor, and they're able to uh, relieve your pain such that it makes you able to now move, again, I say they're facilitators of movement, then I think that's a responsible uh, practitioner. Uh, but if their suggestion is, is that by cracking something on your body that you're now uh, on a rehab program in the absence of uh, an inc increased physical activity, uh, I think that is not a responsible practitioner. So uh, I do that cautiously. I have friends in the industry that work as physical therapists and chiropractors that I respect, and they're very smart people, and they help cl their clients. Um, but the idea that you pathologize someone as needing uh, you know, having a certain condition, needing their intervention in order to function uh, is irresponsible. Stan, I love the walking piece for a number of reasons. And one thing you didn't mention, which is a great part of adopting that early on in life or even later in life is the fact that you can carry that through when you get older as a great form of moving your body, which brings me to, and you're only 55, but you know, you're, you're aging Somebody who is starting to age, say they're in that bracket of 55 plus, and they want to do a handful of exercises specifically to make sure they have mobility as they age and to make sure they can still move their body as they age. Are there a handful of exercises you'd recommend to them? Yeah, I mean, we, we like push-pull legs. We like to work our back, you know, our, our posterior chain, back and hamstrings. We like to work our... our uh, uh, chest and shoulders and triceps and we like to work our legs, you know? So now anything that you do that helps you to maintain or gain strength over time uh, or, you know, resist the inevitable decline uh, is, you know, I say the best exercise is the one you'll do. And, and that, that all of these equipment, pieces of equipment, barbells and uh, dumbbells and, and uh, equipment at the gym machines, they're all just tools in that process um, you know, bands, I don't care. I'm, I'm not, ag I'm agnostic about it. As long as you get in there consistently and you challenge your muscle to such a degree that it, uh, it maintains its strength. It's, it's told, Hey, I still need you. Uh, consistency to me is, is the big thing. Uh, and any exercise that you do, I do like to see some axial loading for the spine, whether that's a weighted carry or, you know, potentially a squat or a variation thereof, an SSB bar box squat, or uh, even a partial deadlift or a, uh, you know, I mentioned just walking with weights in your hands, at least that loads the spine and the hips, which, uh, you know, potentially those uh, could deteriorate hips in particular, uh, for women in particular, get sufficient calcium, get sufficient protein and get sufficient loading uh, consistently on an ongoing basis throughout the rest of your life. It's not a, uh, there's no finish line to this. That, that's, that's maintenance is what it is. You know, say the same thing about oil or gas or air in your tires, you know, it's something you have to consistently pay attention to, or you're just, you're just going to start to decline. And I've said this, the body's regenerative, not degenerative. And as you age, you may need to move a little more. Now, I'm not saying you have to have, you know, high fatigue and squat 500 pounds, uh, but you may need, you need to move a little more frequently to keep the blood flowing and keep the lymphatic system going and to keep those muscles stimulated. And uh, so, I think that's what generally happens. A lot of the sarcopenia that we see with aging is, is just really due to inactivity or less activity. Let's talk about your journey into aging as somebody who, you know, you've been competing all your life and your aesthetic and your strength has been 
you know, something that you've obviously prized and you've gotten confidence from and on and on. Let's talk about that from a psychological aspect. As you age, how you've dealt with your body not performing like it did when you're in your 20s and 30s. You know, I really had to change some of the stimulus. As I mentioned, when I was younger, I could go in and crush myself on these big barbell movements and I could I could recover from it. And uh, as I aged, I realized that that, that fatigue was uh, harder and harder for me to recover from. And I needed to sleep a little more and eat a little better, but also uh, just subject myself to less fatigue. So I designed my program and, and those of people in my position uh, to work uh, with lower fatigue movements. I like the belt squat. I like more maybe isolatory work. Um, I like uh, uh, more concentric work, uh, you know, dragging sleds, maybe running stairs as opposed to running on the track has a lot less impact. You don't have that that breaking or decel- decelerating eccentric force um, when you're running stairs. It's, it's concentric and the recumbent bikes push, 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 push. Walking, of course, is, is, is great as well. Uh, so I, I do try and use exercises, as I mentioned earlier, that allow me to, to have a high stimulus, low fatigue ratio. And I design my programs for my clients much the same. Uh, and then I might not be able to lift as heavy as often. Uh, and that's fine with me. But um, strength is important, uh, more important than hypertrophy. I and mean, even as your muscles start to get a little smaller over the years, you want to maintain as much strength as you can for as long as you can. It's directly related to longevity, particularly, you know, once you're in the top quartile, I mean, stronger isn't better. You're, if you're strong enough to prevent yourself from falling over and breaking a bone, um, we see that after age, I think 70, that, that somewhat north of 40 plus percent of people who fall and break a hip are dead within a year. And it's more a proxy for the fact that they were unhealthy at that point in their life, and which allowed them to fall and their bones were brittle and it allowed them to break and they were you know probably uh, well into their decline as a result so uh, i look at these things both in terms of lifespan and health span how functional are you i hate using that term i, I despise it because <laughs> it's such so arbitrary anybody could just pick whatever exercise and you should be able to do this <laughs> it's like, well you know it really doesn't matter as long as you're strong enough uh, those are all specific applications of strength should you choose to practice them things like a turkish get up or whatever it doesn't tell me anything uh, we saw that with grip strength you know we measured grip strength and saw that, that the people with the better grip strength live longer so next thing you know people are out there with their little grippers and and trying to do dead hangs and like it's a proxy for overall strength and i don't care what measure you use but overall you should be strong and then should you choose to ap- apply that strength in any thing that you enjoy, then by all means do so. What I'm really curious about, though, is the mental aspect, the psychological, your self-identity being so yeah, caught up in this. And, and and people, you know, yeah. you're be- you're in the spotlight, you're being looked at, you're being judged for how the size of you. And then now you're 55 and it's, you know, you've pivoted. And yeah. I'm sure you've you've brought new things into your world to make up for things that have gone. But talk about psychologically how you went through that transition. It's hard. I see this with a lot of powerlifters. This is the reason a lot of people reach out to me because they had identified themselves by their powerlifting accomplishments. And, and obviously, as you age, you're going to get weaker. There's no question about it, um, particularly as you, you get past the point at which you're willing to consume uh, you know, a significant amount of performance enhancing drugs, which obviously augment your performance and is not maintainable, particularly health wise. So as you age, you're going to have to be more and more uh, cognizant of that fact. And then you're going to be able to lift less. I mean, Larry Wheels is going through this now, you know, where he switched to TRT dose and his, his weights that he can lift have gone down significantly. And he's very publicly showing everybody that there's a big difference. But uh, mentally speaking, you, you need to find other ways that this is uh, uh important to you and make it enjoyable. Like I said, I just picked different exercises and and, and I just kind of went around the gym and, and crossed off all the things that made me hurt and chose alternatives. They're all just tools. And, and I, I, I'm not married to any particular exercise or bar or whatever else. And so I, I, I tried to uh, excel or progress on uh, more isolatory movements uh, and maybe adjust my stance or whatever to expose the quadricep more than adding in the glutes and the lumbar spine. So I was under less load, utilizing less fatigue. 
but you know, psychologically speaking, I just obviously I wanted to be fit, I want to be healthy. More than anything, I want to practice what I preach. I see a lot of folks as they get up in the age, they just kind of stop consistently doing enough and and uh, unfortunately maybe just abandoned it altogether because it can't be what it was. And you know, once you redefine what it is and 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 have a, a forward looking view as to what the next five years will look like. I think you can embrace that, be confident about that, and uh, you know, and enjoy that. And I love training now again, and pain free. That's kind of my 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 purpose with all of this. So I'm, uh, you know, that would be my suggestion is just to kind of try and redefine who you are and what it takes to maintain that, and embrace it. You're maybe you're talking to a different audience now, as I am. You know, I always think it's funny when these little young. 20 year old guys are watching my content and they're like, yeah, Rhino. And I'm like, dude, I'm older than your dad. And you know, I, I've got a completely different audience that I'm really talking to now in terms of general health and blood testing and 10 minute walks and the like. But uh, you know, I, I think that you just, you end up moving into a different era in your life to where you're talking to a group of people who maybe have aged with you and they need a different message. And you can certainly, you know, uh, be a, a leader in that regard. Well, that's why I think this this aspect of the mental aspect of aging and pivoting is so important because you're somebody that has been through it and and people can gain a lot from hearing how you transitioned. Yeah. You mentioned performance enhancing drugs. I'm curious, when you were competing, how big of a piece of the puzzle were they? And then is this something you've let go where you're at now? It's huge. There's no question. Uh, both in bodybuilding and powerlifting, that you can achieve milestones much, much greater than your natural potential. You can go beyond your genetic potential, although there are hyper responders that that do even better on performance enhancing drugs than others. I, there's, there's not an, an equal uh, responding. You see people who use them and don't make extraordinary progress and people who use very little of them and do. But uh, I was diagnosed hypogonadal when I was 20 years old. When I got a blood test, I had varicocele, which in some percentage of people uh, can cause low T, low testosterone. Uh, and so I went uh, therapeutically, uh, went on testosterone at that age. So I've been using testosterone uh, for well over 30 years. And then throughout my competitive career, of course, a little bit was good and a little bit more turned out to be better. Uh, and there's you know, definitely a, a point at which that becomes uh, extremely compromising to your health. And we push those limits, you know, to compete against each other. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend it after looking back at everything that I went through and the times at which, I mean, I went off for 10 years from 1996 to 2005 or uh, right about there, 1997 to 2006, when I started competing again in 06. Uh, and it was miserable because I was hypogonadal and I didn't use any therapy or treatment or anything. And I, I can remember that time. It was, it's, what a, all the brain fog and, and the, uh, it's just, there's a host of, uh, of problems that go along with being low T. And then as we get older now, I see people who never use testosterone, uh, in their, in their late forties and fifties who are now low T. Uh, and it can, it can be a wonderful treatment. You know, the same as a, a woman going through menopause who might need, uh, estrogen therapy or someone with Hashimoto's who might need, um, um, uh, thyroid therapy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to demonize testosterone. Uh, obviously there's people who, you know, as I did throughout my competitive career would, uh, abuse that. Uh, but as a medical intervention for people suffering from, from very real day-to-day -day symptoms, uh, ED, fatigue, uh, weakness, body composition changes, sleep, uh, all kinds of, of different issues that result. Uh, I would certainly recommend that they get a blood test and get therapy if it wasn't correctable with lifestyle behaviors, uh, as I would, again, with hypothyroidism and, and menopause. Uh, so uh, it, it's been an interesting journey. And, uh, you know, I try not to be too judgmental. Obviously, a lot of folks judge what I did throughout my career. But as I said, you know, the things that we do to ourselves, whether uh, natural or enhanced, to accomplish our, our fitness uh, pursuits, aren't necessarily healthy. And I see a lot of natural athletes putting their body through hell, uh, multiple surgeries and broken bones and concussions. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, that's the nature of the game. You know, if you want to 
be the best at something, uh, you're going to put your body through hell. Do you feel like with where the sport is today, bodybuilding, powerlifting, there's more of these drugs being used by performers or less? Or how do you feel it's evolved over the years? It's a little bit of both. Uh, more people are competing now, and so more people are using performance enhancing drugs. You got people that aren't competing on social media that just want to, you know, have an Instagram shoot that are using them uh, who, who may never compete. But we've also seen a huge uh, natural group of people that have come up since it switched from, you know, when I was coming up in bodybuilding it, at six foot, you needed to be 250 on stage or you weren't going to be an IFBB pro. And I was 158 in my first show. So, and that was all that was there for me. There wasn't men's, uh, uh, there wasn't classic and there wasn't men's physique. Now I think there's, uh, there's other role models out there, whether it's natural or in men's physique, potentially more attainable. I'm not suggesting those people don't use performance enhancing drugs. They probably the vast majority of them certainly do in the IFBB. Um, but uh, that's a physique that that someone could reasonably strive for uh, in the absence of, of drugs. And there's a lot of natural federations uh, that uh, a lot of great, smart, uh, hardworking, uh, Dr. Lane Norton, a uh, host of others that uh, compete in, even in powerlifting, Greg Knuckles and others who are drug tested, uh, who have done very well. I mean, I'm proud of their accomplishments. They're uh, you know, probably 90% as strong as some of the best drug using athletes out there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't pass judgment. I, I just can speak to people from personal experience, what the ups and downs were. And uh, I just, uh, I like that more people are involved in fitness. But you got to understand it's, it's fitness and health are not the same thing. And uh, as far as competition goes, people are probably more and more likely to, to, to go on the dark side just to try and maximize their results. Testosterone is obviously an important hormone for males and females. Males generally are probably more concerned with it and maintaining, you know, a high number within a high normal range, you know, as the age specifically. For yeah. somebody that is maybe a little bit low or they just want to maintain within that high normal range without using drugs, what are some of the things you'd recommend to a male who's, you know, starting to age or even a male who is younger, who gets tested and, and realizes they need to do something to boost that. Yeah. It's symptom driven. One individual with a 400 testosterone may not have symptoms while another might. Uh, and so it's hard to tell just from the blood test. You got to also find out if they're suffering from other symptom. If you want to raise your testosterone within the normal range, uh, you know, mostly lifestyle behaviors of getting more sleep, uh, decreasing stress, not overtraining, having sufficient thyroid function, uh, those kinds of things, exercising regularly, obviously lifting weights has a good impact, particularly, I think, potentially some HIIT style of training, some real high intense training, not too often, but uh, that can stimulate exposure to sunlight, vitamin D levels, et cetera, although, you know, super uh, over, over consuming those things doesn't grow uh, raised testosterone to any significant level. There's also a lot of research that suggests even in Olympic athletes that uh, they perform at a very high level with suppressed testosterone. Uh, and then we see this commonly in say UFC fighters, just because they're training so hard, their testosterone will be suppressed. Similar to the female triad, as I mentioned earlier, when you're in a calorie deficit or training really, really hard, your, your hormones will get compromised. And hopefully that's, you know, just the last few weeks or a month before competition, you do everything you can to to abate that, but oftentimes it's not that big a deal, uh, maybe just in terms of fatigue. Uh, but this idea of hyper-focusing on moving your testosterone from 500 to 700, not meaningful. It really isn't, particularly with all of these supposed, you know, deer antler and a host of other stupid supplements that just, they just don't work. Uh, testosterone boosters may claim that they increase testosterone by 100% or 200%. Uh, that's, you know, relative to the control groups increase. And it's not like you're going to take your testosterone from 500 to a thousand. It's like the control group might've gone from 500 to 510 and the, um, intervention might've gone from 500 to 520. Well, that would be a hundred percent increase over the control control group, but it's not a hundred percent increase on your baseline. I hope, I hope folks understand when these statistics are, are, 
are often discussed that that they're uh, they're uh, they're used specifically to to market something to you and uh, they're not meaningful. And a lot of this happens in the industry when we talk about this research and we look at relative risks versus actual risks or you know relative increases versus actual increases and then whether or not it's meaningful. And I see a lot of scientists, you know, highly qualified PhDs in their field. Uh, making claims about things in the fitness industry using some plausible or possible mechanism of action, but taking these giant logical leaps across these moats and claiming that potentially this outcome could result. Uh, be, uh, whereas, in fact, when you look at the outcome studies and specifically, uh, you know, take groups and, and uh, use those interventions, it's just not meaningful if if even beneficial at all. And so you really have to be careful and look at what the real world results are, the outcomes, as opposed to talking about mechanisms and all that kind of stuff. Up until this point, we've spent a lot of our conversation talking about the person that wants to put on healthy muscle, uh, build up lean muscle mass. I want to flip things here before we part ways and talk about the individual who has extra weight and this weight isn't good weight, it's fat, and they want to yeah. burn that fat and also use weightlifting as part of that protocol to help burn the fat, but then other modalities you'd include as well to help that person get to a healthy weight, but coming the other way. Yeah, you know, I think we covered a lot of those things as far as our toolbox of satiety is at the top of that list. If somebody wants to lose weight, they have to maintain a calorie deficit. And now you want to pull out all the stops in order to try and, and do that. You know, you want to have a plan. Uh, meal prepping is probably the most successful intervention that you can utilize to help you comply with the diet. Uh, you know, whether you order meal prep from my meal prep company and I ship it right to your door or you cook it yourself. Uh, I don't care. Uh, but meal prepping is a successful uh, behavior. Uh, obviously, tracking. Is, is huge. That's what gets measured, gets improved, weigh daily, you know, write down your hours of sleep, um, you know, keep track of your, maybe your step counts. You make sure that you're continuing to get at least uh, 8,000 plus steps a day. As people start losing weight, they tend to move less. I talked about non-exercise activity. And so you want to track your steps to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, those are big things. And of course, the high satiety foods, higher protein meals and more uh, more fiber and, uh, or boiled potatoes and oranges, uh, more, you know, unprocessed whole foods that you make at home, uh, and less processed foods. Those should be a much smaller portion of your diet because it's just easy to overconsume. I like to get the snacks out of the house. It's not to say you can't go have a snack, but you create a barrier entry if you got to get in your car and drive and get it. Whereas in the house, you might keep things like, I like biltong, which is a jerky that's really low in fat and sugar. Uh, it's just something that you can just sit there and chew on and kind of satisfy that. A lot of times it's not hunger, but it's boredom, uh, stress, social situations, you know, trauma. There's a whole lot of other reasons why people eat. And so if I if I have things around to snack on, uh, biltong, the jerky I mentioned, or uh, fat-free Greek yogurt with blueberries and strawberries, those kinds of things are great uh, go-tos to have readily available as snacks for you. Uh, that's the big stuff. And I mentioned, of course, the 10 minute walks are huge and you want to do some sort of weight training, but don't, don't, uh, you know, more exercise is not equal more weight loss. You don't start yourself on this program. That's not sustainable. and doesn't fit your lifestyle uh, that you're just going to not do. And then criticize yourself for uh, the fact that you just kind of bit off more than you could chew or busy people. You got jobs, you got kids, you know, a whole lot of obligations. These 10 minute walks, they can fit anywhere. I walk my kids to school in the morning and I pick them up in the afternoon. When I travel, I walk around the hotel. Um, when I'm waiting for the bags, the baggage claim, I'm walking around baggage claim. You know, I'm just using every opportunity I can. When I walk from the plane to baggage claim, it's a deliberate. I'm, I'm pumping my arms. You know, I see people getting off the tram uh, that, that, you know, started where I started and uh, I got a 10 minute walk in. So, I use all those opportunities at night, certainly after dinner, um, uh, you know, and if the weather doesn't permit or if your neighborhood has drive-by shootings then get a recumbent bike and sit in your, uh, you know, in your family room there in front of the TV and ride that bike. It's just 10 minutes. You know, it's about probably less time it would take to make a phone call or watch your favorite YouTube video, uh, you know, or our podcast for that matter. And we can uh, uh, exercise during that time. So those are the kind of the big recommendations. And I got to say this, uh, 
there is a there are people who have a very hard time losing weight. As mentioned earlier, hunger is an overwhelming uh, stimulus, and that is what the major cause of of uh, lack of weight loss compliance is. You just get hungry and tired, uh, and hence not wanting people to overtrain. Uh, there is a medication that is uh, utilized, that is FDA approved and utilized quite successfully on long-term trials with very minimal side effects called semaglutide. And basically it suppresses your appetite. That's all it does. And I've had clients who have had roller coaster rides with weight loss and regain who have started this medication and uh, the control group on a two-year study might lose two or three percent of their body weight uh, and be able to maintain that. These people lose 16 to 18% of their body weight and are able to maintain it uh, with very little adverse effects other than maybe some people have some digestive distress, a little bit of nausea from uh, the dose dependent is really what that is caused by. So I have to mention, if you're struggling with weight loss, that uh, that is a reasonable avenue. Merrick Health provides the product uh, as well. And you can get it from your doctor, uh, but it, it is extremely effective medication for controlling hunger, uh, or you might just only eat once a day. And, you know, that, that may be what you need, at least to get, uh, I say, concurrently learn the behave, the long-term behaviors that will allow you to maintain that weight loss. So you don't have to be on the medication all the time. But if you have some significant health problems as a result of your excess weight, which is common, uh, this would be a great way to kind of get that first seven to 10 percent of your body weight off and experience all the health benefits that go with that let's stick to the natural side of things here though and talk about we mentioned protein being very satiating what are some i want to make sure we highlight this what are some of the specific foods people can include that are besides protein which could be you know plant-based or or meat but what are some of the specific foods people might want to include i think oranges is one of them you mentioned it but what are what are some of the others yeah, you know, there's a satiety index. The ones I always remember are the ones that are way over out here on the chart in, in terms of satiety. It was boiled potatoes and oranges. Those were the top of the list. And then everything that contained protein, whether it was fish or steak or turkey or uh, eggs or yogurt, everything that contained protein, and then everything that contained a lot of fiber, uh, all three of those, you know, fruits and vegetables, both. I like the low sugar fruits. Again, the blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, and oranges. Uh, just because they're higher in fiber and water, lower in total calories. Uh, and so they keep you satiated with fewer calories. And you could most certainly eat uh, legumes and, and, and that kind of for your protein if you were vegetarian or vegan. Uh, they do, in order to get a satisfactory amount of protein, they're going to come with more calories. Uh, but as long as you're cautious you know, to watch the total caloric load, uh, and then you, you could supplement some of the additional protein using a a powder, a soy-based or a pea-based powder as well. So those are the those are the big rocks. You know, just any kind of protein that you prefer as a lean protein. I'm again cautious to say you got to watch that saturated fat. You know, butter, bacon, ice cream, coconut oil, uh, even ribeyes. Unfortunately, they're so high in saturated fat as a percentage of total calories. It's going to be hard to keep your total fats and your saturated fats in particular uh, below. The threshold that uh, that uh, the American Heart Association suggests is, uh, and all the research suggests, it's not just the AHA uh, can drive up LDL, which is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. I used to not believe this. I I, I went down the rabbit hole, as did Lane Norton just four years ago, said that saturated fat was healthy. As did Examine.com last year. They have fourteen PhDs on their staff, and they posted literature suggesting that you know saturated fat was fine. Uh, but there's enough uh, converging lines of evidence now, especially with the Mendelian randomization trials showing people have genetic predispositions, uh, having very different outcomes in terms of their response to LDL as a result of uh, their saturated fat consumption and their, and their uh, subjectivity to all-cause mortality, particularly cardiovascular disease. So there's enough research there. And, and uh, again, I was in the camp that thought that if you were healthy, and you were relatively lean and active that it didn't matter. But in fact, if you do a blood test, particularly if you're, uh, if you have some sort of genetic predisposition for hypercholesterolemia, uh, you need to keep your LDLs under hundred and more specifically your ApoB should be monitored because uh, that's a, a 
probably the most accurate predictor of your cardiovascular disease risk over time. When it comes to supplements and supplement-like foods, you've talked about dextrose, you've talked about protein powders, vitamin D. I'm curious if there's any others that you're using on a regular basis. Maybe magnesium. Maybe magnesium. It's hard to get from food. It does seem to have some benefits. Increases vitamin D uptake, absorption. Um, and beyond that, maybe omega-3s for people who don't want to eat uh, salmon a couple times a week. And that's probably the foundation. Beyond that, uh, doesn't mean there aren't some supplements that may help some people in certain circumstances, but uh, that's kind of the general. And a, a multivitamin, you know, even though a lot of the research suggests that it's kind of equivocal as to whether or not it provides any, any benefit. But uh, what I find is that active individuals utilize more of those micronutrients and might need uh, supplementation more than a sedentary individual. Stan, as a dad, how do you feel about kids working out? What age do you feel it's appropriate to have the conversation and introduce them? When is it too early for them to begin lifting weights? And when is it good for them? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. And it's, it's never too early. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics in their position statement has stated, and, and in quotations, I will say that it is essential for adolescents to do resistance training. Hugely important for women in terms of bone mineral density, because most of that is accumulated uh, in their younger years and then uh, deteriorates over time as they age. And that's a huge problem, osteopenia and osteoporosis. It uh, not only is less injurious as a activity, as a physical activity, than almost any comparator, I think right up into and including swimming, of all things, uh, certainly any con contact sport. There's fewer injuries in weightlifting than that. 65% of the injuries from weightlifting are from dropping a weight on yourself, not from lifting the weight. <laughs> uh, it does not cause uh, stunt growth. It's a complete myth. There's no evidence to support that. Um, it decreases injuries in any sport that you participate in. Uh, obviously, increases bone mineral density and lean body tissue. Uh, but I think more importantly, the, having that stimulus through adolescence, the building the habits at an early age, which is largely neural adaptation, you just kind of become more coordinated at, at moving things around and your body learns to recruit and employ muscle tissue more effectively. It's a lot of it at the young age in the absence of testosterone isn't hypertrophy, it's neural adaptation. And the strength translates from that, uh, just the ability to practice and use the muscles. Um I've got a, a what I call a kid's power hour, vertical kid's power hour. I run every Sunday at my gym, Sin City Iron here. at the, And I kind of set it up just because I wanted my kids to come in and train. Um, 11 a.m. every Sunday. And now we've got over 25 kids from, I say, from kindergarten to college. Uh, I've got six-year-olds and seven-year-olds, and they're learning to squat, bench, and deadlift. And that's all I do. I take them through, and I, I show them how to squat, bench, and deadlift. And they get three rounds, and they do three sets of five. And I tell them to lift the heaviest weight they can handle with good form. Uh, and progress it over time. And as they get stronger, they advance to a heavier bar. I have things set up by weight. I have five squat bars set up with progressive weight load. And as they get stronger, they get to advance uh, along the line. Same with the deadlift, same with the bench. I have a little like five pound aluminum bar to start just for coordination. And then I move up to a slightly heavier bar and then a 45 pound bar. And then I start putting plates on them and I set them up and the kids go get in the line with the weight that they can handle at their current level of, uh, of, of performance. And uh, I tell them that their goal every week is to is to be able to knock out five reps with the heaviest weight they can handle, and, and we're going to measure it and progress it over time. And they love it. The return, the the, uh, the the return. Everybody comes back every week. They love it. They tell their parents they love it. I make it fun for them, you know. And and we, uh, it's it's great. But at any age, uh, there's a fantastic series of articles. Uh, and I don't want to get the name wrong, but it's through Barbell Medicine. And so uh, it's like a five-series article on youth training that, that gives you all the information you could possibly need. We'll find it and put it in the show notes. It just escapes me. I'm so sorry. I, I, I'll, we'll put it in the show notes, but uh, it, it's an extraordinary read that could get anybody started from beginning to actually having their kids lift, including an actual training program and all the recommendations that are pertinent to that. Uh, so you could you could hit the ground running, you know, if you don't have a program like mine in your city. And how old are your kids now? And at what age did they start lifting? 
eight and 10. They started lifting out in the garage with me for, you know, at least the last three or four years since they were five and six years old. Yeah, they would come out and just do whatever, just have fun. Most of it is is setting the example. Their kids will do what you do. They see better than they hear. And if you're out there exercising and doing push-ups and squats, then they want to come out and hang out with you. And then they want to try what you're doing. And uh, just just having that that influence, that role model, I think is what's most important. And making it fun for them. When uh, We know that kids who participate in more sports do better in sports uh, as opposed to those who specialize in high school and college. If you multiple sports people athletes actually have better long-term uh, results in scores. I know we got to part ways, but quickly I want to address one more population that might be tuning in here. And for somebody who's watching the video or has looked up your pictures or videos online, they know you're a, you're a big guy. And there's a group of people out there, whether it be men or women, who want the benefits of resistance training, but they don't want the size. So what I want to do, because they've been listening and, and taking all your advice and yeah. thinking, okay, this is great, but I don't want to be big like Stan, which is, you know, everybody's different. Yeah. I've been, I've been doing this all my life. You know, I've struggled to gain, to gain every single ounce of muscle in my body and I have to do an extraordinary amount to maintain it. Uh, that does not happen. You don't wake up one morning and be like, oh my God, I'm Ronnie Coleman. You know, I did a set of squats yesterday. Uh it, it does not happen. Gaining muscle is hard, particularly for natural athletes, but it it, uh, it lends so much in terms of your metabolism, but also in terms of the shape of your body. Losing weight, you can just become skinny fat. And, you know, if you want to be firm and tone, I hate to use the word tone because building muscle is, uh, isn't a matter of lifting pink dumbbells for 10 reps when you could have done 30. Uh, building muscle is has a specific required stimulus, as we talked about earlier. Um but it just doesn't happen. People don't wake up one morning. What often happens is that women in particular will go to the gym and start lifting weights. And then, as I mentioned earlier, they'll just start eating more and, and they'll actually get fatter and say they're bulking up from the weightlifting. I'm like, no, <laughs> you're lifting weights. You got hungrier, you ate more and you added more body fat. Sorry, but uh, sometimes that happens. But as far as gaining muscle goes um, in the absence of uh, performance enhancing drugs, it's a long, slow process. And, uh, Nobody wakes up one morning and, and says they, they got too big. This doesn't happen. Well, it's important we address that. We don't want to hinder anybody from starting to resistance yeah. train and get the benefits they can get from that. And Stan, really enjoyed the conversation. We covered a wide range of topics. And uh, I enjoyed your book. Really enjoyed this again. Thank you for coming on the show. We're going to link up the book. We're going to link up your social media in the show notes, along with that article that we'll, we'll have you dig up. And... Just want to thank you again for coming on the show. This was great. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you having me. Now that you're done my conversation with Stan, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Sal. There's a lot more to learn when it comes to resistance training and weight loss. I'll see you over there. You know, there's this belief that, that workouts need to be grueling, grinding, painful.